well. Great, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. So thank you so much for uh, showing up to our webinar today. Very excited for this presentation and conversation. So I'm T.T. Lyles Nubu Ali, Senior Advisor at the Southern Education Foundation. For those who might not know, the Southern Education Foundation uh, is a nonprofit donor supported organization. We advance educational equity throughout the Southern states, the 17 Southern state region. And we are so honored to have Sabrina Jones with us this summer. So Sabrina is a Leadership for Educational Equity Fellow. Uh, we have hosted LEAD Fellows here in many years in the past, and it's always an honor. So first, gratitude and thank you to the LEAD Fellowship Program for uh, allowing us to experience Sabrina this summer. So the LEAD Policy and Advocacy Summer Fellowship uh, connects LEAD members with high impact policy and advocacy leaders and organizations who are focused on education, children, youth, and communities for an eight week period. And it's a full-time placement. So Sabrina came with us just seven weeks ago now, I believe. Um, and very quickly, we were able to uh, take the research that she'd done in her graduate studies uh, and I worked very closely with her to develop a policy brief. Um, during Sabrina's interview, my ears immediately perked up <laughs> when I heard about the research she'd done on teacher stress and burnout. And we were in the process of determining what her capstone project for the summer would be. Uh, so from that very first conversation, was very excited and knew uh, that this research that she had done could be incredibly impactful and relevant to policymakers, to practitioners, and to other teachers who were looking to see some of their concerns articulated. Uh, so we worked together over the summer to go from her master's thesis to then uh, helping her understand what a policy brief looks like and how you connect it to current policy issues. We further fleshed it out, uh, of course, through the outline. She worked with other members of our team. Many thanks to Megan Crow, who is a senior analyst uh, at SEF, as well as Gretchen Wright, our comms director, uh, to understand how to frame it in, in ways that policymakers can really take up the information and then get ready to do things like have media outreach and do op-eds and talk about her work beyond the realm of just the research world. We're very interested in making research relevant to those who need it the most. And so it's been an honor to work with Sabrina on this. And what you'll experience today is Sabrina sharing out the top line findings. I'll pop back on at the end to talk more about some of the policy implications of the research. And then we'll open it up for Q&A at the very end. There is a Q&A box here, so you can feel free if you already have questions to pop them into the Q&A box or pop them into the chat with your hello. And the brief itself is going live today. So we'll have that link ready for you all, uh, hopefully in the chat by the end of this, but certainly you will get an email afterwards with a link to the recording, as well as a link to the live brief. Okay, and with that, I'll just pass it over to Sabrina. All right. So throughout this brief, uh, we looked critically at teacher stress and burnout. I'm a former fourth grade teacher from Miami-Dade County Public Schools. Um, and I came to this position through Teach for America. I studied through a traditional teacher preparation program. Um, so teacher, teacher studies and teacher practitioners is something that is very near and dear to my heart. Um, and you hear about teacher stress and burnout a lot, but when you're in the classroom, it really becomes a reality. Um, and I wanted to work to see what are different ways we can work to combat the stress and burnout that teachers are experiencing every day. And one way that we found is through social and emotional development. So I wanna start by laying the groundwork for the impact that teachers have in schools all across America. So they're the most important school-based factor in student success. So what this means is every minute of every day that a teacher is in the classroom, they're making decisions back to back that are gonna drastically impact students, their academic outcomes and their development, their whole child development. So whether that's socially, emotionally, physically, mentally, or academically, teachers are making the biggest impact on a day-to-day -day basis. They're leading academic instruction and creating a learning environment where students can build relationships. They have the responsibility of creating an environment where students can interact, they can collaborate, um, and teaching has really moved from just being an instructional capacity to wearing multiple hats. Teachers are becoming counselors, they're working with parents, they're doing all of these different ways that they're impacting students um, to help them grow into responsible citizens. 
in my experience, I had students that were experiencing all kinds of things outside of the classroom. And as teachers, you know that students don't just drop that when they walk in the door. So we're taking students, meeting them where they're at, not using a deficit mindset and working with them in ways that we can help build their capacity. One of the biggest impacts of this is student teacher relationships. So student teacher relationships are really important because studies have shown that when students are supported by teachers and feel that they have a strong bond that their academic and scores increase. It also can decrease student stress so it's beneficial to both students and teachers. So going from that I want to touch on teacher stress a little bit. So in an intake of multiple professions teaching was found to be one of the worst professions for physical and psychological health and job satisfaction. So teachers are experiencing some of the most stress of any um, job that is out there. Now, when I went into the university, people are like, it's going to be a stressful job. And I was like, OK, OK, but this is my true calling. This is what I want to do. Um, and when you enter into the classroom, I didn't feel that I was adequately prepared for what the realities of 21st century education looked like. Um, things such as testing pressure, such as resources, such as student home stress. I wasn't aware of what that stress would feel like and how it compounds on teachers. Um, and to add to that, with the pandemic, it has just raised the bar for teachers and responsibility and with stress. So teachers went from being responsible for academics and social emotional learning to now becoming um, responsible for technology and things like that. Certain categories of teachers are experiencing the stress more acutely. So specifically new teachers, teachers within their first five years. Um, people generally say, if you can make it five years in the profession, you'll be there for life. Um, but the stress level and the turnover rate within the first five years is astronomical. So, and teacher, new teachers are, have a higher share of low income students. So these students are being disproportionately affected by teachers under stress. Also teachers in urban schools shoulder more of the weight of testing pressure and students from low income backgrounds, which compound, compounds to different kinds of stress in the classroom. And finally, teachers of color. There's a multitude of immense emotional pressure that has been placed on these teachers specifically, and it's been exacerbated by the pandemic. So these three categories of teachers are experiencing an acute amount of stress in the classroom. And when we really look at this overall, stress is the number one reason that teachers leave the classroom. We hear a lot about low compensation, low pay, and what while high pay for teachers is incredibly important, that's not the reason that teachers are leaving the classroom. It's high up there, but the number one reason is because of the stress that teachers are under on a day-to-day -day basis. So if we really wanna start impacting teacher retention, the first thing we need to look at is how we can reduce their stress. So some of the impacts of this stress is absenteeism and turnover. 29% of teachers were chronically absent, which means they are missing 10 school days or more. And this is important, one, because it impacts the broader school climate. If you're seeing new faces in the building all the time, different substitute teachers, it's not creating an atmosphere of stability, and that's what we want for our students. And furthermore, it's been proven that when a teacher is chronically absent, it directly impacts the scores and outcomes of student academics. Now, teacher turnover is highest in the South. We've seen that Southern states has the highest rate of turnover. So we're moving over to turnover. Now, there have been different initiatives in the South for both turnover and absenteeism. We've seen a move towards monetary incentives um, for absenteeism, which means that if a teacher is in school and doesn't take X amount of days off, then there could be a monetary bonus attached to it. Um, and we want to look at the root cause analysis for this. So monetary incentives such as that, are we analyzing teacher stress? Are we just trying to find other ways to keep teachers in the classroom? Now turnover is 50% higher in Title I schools and 70% higher in schools that predominantly serve students of color. So again, if we take an equity framework when we're looking at this issue, it's disproportionately affecting um, these different types of students. So as I said, turnover disrupts classrooms and broader school and student outcomes. Now it's affecting the school on a day-to-day -day basis, but it's also affecting our budgets on a district level. So the cost of teacher replacement can range from $9,000 per teacher in rural and suburban districts and more than $20,000 in urban ones. And this is the data for teacher replacement costs. If we're looking at absenteeism, there's also the cost of substitute teachers, which is impacting a certain percent of the school's budgets. Now, the pandemic has accelerated the teacher turnover rates, especially for teachers of color. When we've looked at data for the 2020-2021 school year, 
the amount of teachers that say that they would not come back to the classroom has dramatically increased. Now, when we look at turnover date or turnover data, it has raised to about from 5% to about a current 8%. So there is an increase in teachers that are leaving the profession. This is something that's incredibly important to me because as a person who entered the teaching profession through a preparation route, you study for four years to be certified and an expert in one profession. When you join a school of education, you want to be a teacher. It's a, for a lot of people, it's a lifetime calling, not for everyone, but a lot. It tends to be the nature of the profession. And we're, when we're seeing that kind of turnover at a profession that's built in this way, we know that there's an immense amount of stress and pressure that we're gonna wanna work on. So how are we going to work with teachers to help manage the stress? Now, what we're proposing isn't going to be an all solution, but it's a way to help teachers manage with the realities of the classroom that we're into that they're entering into. We want them to be better prepared to face these realities and to better support their students. So this graphic might be familiar to some of you. It's produced by the Castle Organization, which is one of the leading organizations for social emotional learning. A lot of people are familiar with it for students. We see these five core competencies, and a lot of times we see them integrated into lesson plans, and how can we teach these five skills to students? But I really wanna take that lens and flip it and show how can we focus on this for teachers? I think it is really important that we're developing these five skills for teachers. Now we hear the buzzword social and emotional learning a lot, and I really wanna break down what those five different competencies are. So there's this wheel, we're gonna focus on the triangles in the middle, the five competencies. So if you start on the first two orange ones, you have self-awareness and self-management. These both have to do with internal work. So self-awareness has to do with the ways that you are understanding and interpreting your own emotions. That can be stress if that's what we're focusing on the classroom. And teachers, something happens in the classroom. How is the teacher interpreting it and internalizing that? And then self-management has to do with how the teacher is reacting to that. If there's a classroom disruption, what's their reaction? What is that on the minute decision that they're making? And how is that self-management skill developed to best support students in learning environments? Now, when we move to the two green quadrants, these have to do with how you interact with others, social awareness and relationship skills. So social awareness has to do with the teacher's capacity to build empathy. And this is really important. As a teacher, you're usually with anywhere from 10 to 20 students that all have different types of emotions and different personalities. You need to be able to empathize and understand a range of emotions and backgrounds. And then relationship skills is the way that you can build strong collaboration and ways to support that student. And then finally, we have responsible decision making, and that's how you're using all four of these quadrants and then the external actions you're taking and how that impacts those around you. So when you have strong responsible decision making skills, you're able to think through your reactions and see how it's going to impact the learning environment on the day to day basis. Now, this is a lot all at once as someone who's recently experienced my first year teaching. This is something that I've seen personally and in research that could have made a dramatic impact. If there would have been a disruption, I wish the teachers had the opportunity to build these different capacities to know how to better react to situations to create a more beneficial learning environment for students. So when we look at social emotional learning, I mentioned earlier that a lot of time we're looking at it for students, but I would like to focus on teachers. Um, something that we see a lot in research is a three component framework for social and emotional learning. So if you look at the top part of the triangle, this is the learning context. So social and emotional learning kind of works in a top-down manner. It starts with the administration, the communication, and the leadership style that's taking place in the school. And that has to do with the connection to the community. A lot of times you hear this as like the school climate. What kind of initiatives are being done to make sure that the learning context is being taken forward in a way that's both socially and emotionally healthy. Now, once that has been established, Using that atmosphere, you're able to hold professional developments, conversations, meetings that will help build the bottom left side, the SEL of teachers. So we want to build up the SEL of teachers for social emotional learning. That can help reduce this stress that we're seeing as the biggest cause of teacher turnover. It can help give them the skills to build student relationships, which we know can raise test scores and student confidence. And then finally, and what I think is extremely important, is it gives teachers the skills that they wanna be able to model for students. So a lot of times teachers are told, teach social emotional learning skills. 
but they need to be able to do have and do those skills first before they can model it for students. So when a teacher has these skills, a student will be able to see the teacher taking a minute to think, making sure they're making responsible decisions. And when they're modeling that for students, then they can move to instructing the bottom right section, the SEL for students. And when teachers have these capacities, they can better build that instruction into their lesson plans. This will in turn have fewer classroom disruptions from students. There will be stronger peer and teacher relationships and there will be decreased academic frustration in the classroom. When students are able to manage their own emotions and really think about and reflect how they're impacting each other and the overall learning context, the overall classroom environment is going to improve. Now, when you talk about all of that, something that I saw in research was everything was leading towards this idea that stress kind of acts in a cycle in the classroom. When I started reading this type of research, it was like a light bulb. I really, I was like, this is what is happening in schools. And this is a big takeaway for me. This is something that really explained mine and many others experience in the classroom. We talk about stress as something that can be solved and it's a one-time thing, but there's really, really a cyclical nature to stress. So there are two entry points into this cycle. It can either be student stress, stress, which is the top left red, or teacher stress, which is the bottom orange. Stress can manifest in a classroom in a lot of ways. It could be from students due to academic frustrations, at home circumstances, or other outside stressors. Or it could be from teachers due to testing pressures, lack of communication, or low resources. As an educator, I really believe that the atmosphere of the classroom is the responsibility of the teacher and not something that's at the fault of the students. So I think it's really important that we don't take a deficit mindset of student stress, but that we're giving teachers the tools to disrupt the cycle of stress. So when you look at it, when you have students that are stressed for whatever reason, that leads to a disruptive behavior, which can then lead to a lack of attention. Now, if a teacher doesn't have the social emotional skills, to help that student cope with that, then that's going to bleed into the overall classroom environment, moving down to chaotic classrooms. Now, studies have found that even if other students have strong social emotional skills, if they're in a classroom that is chaotic, this is also going to impact their performance scores. So you have chaotic classrooms and low performance scores. This in turn adds to teacher stress. If a teacher is in a stressful or chaotic classroom, they're going to have increased level of stress. And if they're experiencing low performance scores, they have added stress from those testing pressures. And this can either lead to our turnover rate and teachers exit from the profession, or if a teacher is stressed in the moment in the classroom, that can lead to punitive discipline and unfair consequences. This is something that is happening a lot in classrooms. Teachers are experiencing high levels of stress. They're not able to have that self-management and self-awareness skills and they're using punitive discipline an unfair consequence that wasn't agreed upon um, and the learning is further disrupted now and then it keeps going if a student feels that a consequence is unfair or unexpected their go their stress is going to increase then a disrupted behavior will come up and it keeps going in a cycle now social emotional learning is an opportunity for teachers to disrupt this cycle if teachers have the ability to stop pause think, breathe, they have the chance to stop this cycle and we can create exits out of this. Then we're able to get learning back on track and we're able to help students develop these skills. So eventually they'll be able to take their skills and use them in other environments that aren't just the classroom. Because when we're utilizing behavior management, that means that we're just building students' capacities to function in the classroom. Whereas when we build social and emotional skills, we're giving the students the capacities to function and work well throughout their life. Now, I wanna look at different opportunities we have to build these skills for teachers. So as I said, I went through a traditional teacher preparation program, and I felt that this was something that can be really lacking from different university standpoints. So there is an intake of about 30% of the nation's teacher preparation programs. And they looked at how are those five competencies that we looked at earlier from the Castle Five, how are those integrated into teacher preparation. And of those 30%, only 13% offered a course that taught relationship skills, 6% taught a course on self-management skills, and 1% taught self-awareness. Now, this is really important to me. I experienced a lot of an integrated approach to social-emotional learning. 
So you might have a course that's on the learning context. And within that, you might have a unit on student SEL. And we see that a lot in teacher preparation where we're focusing on social emotional learning for students through an integrated approach. Because that's how you want it to seem in the classroom. You want it to cover all of the bases and throughout the entire day and throughout the entire school. However, we're seeing an extreme lack of opportunity for teachers to build their own capacities before they start learning how to integrate it into the classroom. And then in the next one, I wanna talk about the integrating of SEL for teachers. So one way, as I said, is we need to build it through university teacher preparation courses. I've seen through my experience, different crossover collaborations between School of Education and psychology departments. A lot of psychology departments offer courses through a field called positive psychology that is focused on mindfulness training. Um, so universities could take that approach, maybe utilizing a mindfulness course or giving pre-service teachers the opportunity to cross collaborate with different departments. And then the next one we need to look at is in-service professional developments. There are different ways that we can give current teachers the opportunity to build these different capacities. And I wanna highlight some districts that are currently doing this. So I've looked at three districts that are in our Southern region. And one that came top of mind is the Atlanta Public Schools. Now, Atlanta Public Schools have a very interesting approach because they have a district department that's dedicated to social emotional learning. So if you were to look up Atlanta Public Schools social emotional learning, you will see an entire department of individuals that are dedicated to develop curriculum for students and supporting the social emotional learning of both adults and staff members. Atlanta Public Schools has also gone on to build their definition of teaching and leadership excellence to include social emotional learning. So if you look up how does Atlanta Public Schools define excellence for their staff members, one of the categories is has the staff member been developing their social emotional learning, are they working towards that to achieve excellence. And then finally they have social emotional competency competencies and learning standards for their students, so they have explicit ways that they want teachers to meet this need for students, just as you would see with academic standards. Palm Beach County, Florida offers teacher workshops on empathy and implementing social emotional learning in the classroom. So they're giving teachers tools to build their own empathy to work with students and ways that they can integrate it into their lesson plan. They also offer online social emotional learning training modules. This is great when we've looked at the pandemic, how can we make this accessible to technology? And an online training module offers teachers the opportunity to do this in different times of the day. As we know, teachers are extremely busy, and so we want them to have a flexible way to build this capacity and not just add one more thing that they need to do. And finally, Tulsa Public Schools, they offer an introductory social emotional learning one on one course for both principals and teachers. They have pilot schools that are receiving training on a program that's called Ruler, which focuses on what they believe are strong capacities for social emotional skills. This is recognizing, understanding, labeling, expressing, and regulating emotions. And then finally, um, the greater, they use Greater Good in Education resources through UC Berkeley. This is an online module that offers different downloadable content, courses, training modules. that is specifically designed for the field of education. They're using a mindfulness standpoint to be able to give teachers these resources and the ability to manage their own stress. And now we'll move on to the practice and policy recommendations. Yeah, so thank you so much, Sabrina, for that overview. So as I said at the beginning, um, one of the tasks of this fellowship was to really help Sabrina see the ways in which research can be relevant to policy and practice. And so I'm just gonna talk through a couple of ways that uh, this research on teacher SEL um, has some opportunities for use and practice. And then Sabrina, I'll just give you a heads up. I'm gonna ask you a few questions <laughs> to kick off the q and I didn't tell her this, so this is a surprise. Hopefully this doesn't cause any stress. <laughs> um, just about sort of as you've been a teacher, as you're going back into the classroom and as you're thinking about your career, sort of ways in which you see using this research in practical ways. So there are many different uh, ways in which this research can be relevant to policy and practice. And I'll just take a second to go over a few. Um, so as many of you may know, there's been an unprecedented investment in public schools through the American Rescue Plan. Um, and I'm going to talk about some ways in which those funds can be used to address this directly, but I'll just start with uh, a few other um, examples. So as Sabrina mentioned, um, you know, new teachers are those who, those really within the first five years of their 
instruction are those who experience the most stress. Uh, one of the things that districts could consider uh, is providing targeted SEL support to new teachers, uh, focusing there first to help them build the skills to thrive and become effective sooner. We know that that early investment can really pay off in the long term. Uh, the other thing that districts can do is uh, to really think about how monetary attendance incentives are used. Um, so as Sabrina mentioned before, we do know that compensation is a factor in churn and teacher turnover. And we've seen some districts try to introduce attendance incentives, but we do know that that could actually be a disincentive to teachers taking the time that they need to uh, be supported in the ways they need to be supported. Couple that with uh, the, the lack of uh, leave policies in some states, it can really become an untenable situation. So one of the things that we hope that districts will do is really to assess whether or not these policies are discouraging teachers from taking the time off they need to manage their stress and to take care of their social and emotional health and to just really think critically about the use of that particular policy tool. Um, the next recommendation, as Sabrina mentioned, some of what she learned and didn't learn in her teacher preparation program, uh, these programs can uh, take the opportunity to assess what offerings they have for social and emotional skills, training, and really explore opportunities to offer courses that are cross-listed with other departments, perhaps departments of psychology, which often have available courses that may be adapted to an educational context. So there's a real opportunity to leverage existing resources in the college and university setting to make uh, teacher preparation programs more robust and relevant. Uh, the next recommendation we have is that school and district leaders can really think about conducting surveys, holding listening sessions to try to understand well-being and job-related stressors that teachers are facing, um, and then to use that information to target interventions. Oftentimes, and we see this happening in the policy world, you have policy solutions that are very disconnected from the reality of what's happening on the ground. And one of the things we've worked together over the course of the seven weeks uh, is to help really see, help Sabrina see how research can be used to inform policy and not just research that's sort of disconnected, but real lived experience. And so one of the things that Sabrina did uh, was to have conversations with people in district and with teachers to make sure that the recommendations and the brief that we were putting together was really landing in a way that accurately reflected their concerns. And so our recommendation here on a practice level is for schools and districts to consider really listening and uh, understanding what some of the stressors are, being mindful that stressors may impact some teachers in different ways, and then uh, try to create solutions that are mindful of those, uh, those different inequities. The next recommendation we have is specifically around leveraging ESSER funding, so elementary and secondary school emergency relief funds. So in these funds, there's a requirement that 20% of funds be used to address lost instructional time with evidence-based interventions that respond to students' academic and social and emotional needs. And so as Sabrina shared, and as we know, many programs are, are starting to and have been doing a very good job of addressing students' needs, but there's an opportunity to look at those programs and see the ways in which they can also fold in professional development for teachers to develop those SEL skills and help them regulate their own stress. And then finally, uh, as we mentioned that teacher stress is that number one factor that uh, leads to turnover and burnout, we at SEF are always thinking about equity issues and which groups of teachers are affected in different ways. And there's also an opportunity with ESSER funds to address some of those root causes of teacher shortages and take the opportunity to advance strategies that build a diverse and high quality teacher workforce. And this could include partnerships with historically black colleges and universities to further strengthen that pipeline of, of teachers of color. We're seeing increasing numbers of teachers of color come into the profession, uh, which is great because they help to reflect the new majority of students of color in our public schools, but we're also seeing a lot of turnover and churn in those populations and there are ways that we can do better uh, to both strengthen that pipeline and help teachers have uh, an enriching experience while they're there. So with that, uh, we are going to go to the chat and see if there are any questions here 
if there aren't, I'm just going to kick off <laughs> with a surprise question to Sabrina. Uh, and just first, just thank you and applause uh, for uh, just all the great work you've done this summer. It's been such a pleasure working with you. Um, and best part of my job, honestly, <laughs> is really helping uh, people who are, who are taking an interest in this world to see all of the ins and outs of it and what the entire process is and ways in which your lived experience as a teacher can be relevant to decision making at a state level, at a district level, at a local level, or even in a classroom level or a school level. So, so thank you for that. Um, so just to kick off, um, if you could just share, I, I'm sure that there might be specific questions about your research, um, uh, but if you could also just share a little bit about this experience of going from having written a master's thesis last year to then taking it and maybe, <laughs> maybe it's something unrecognizable, or maybe it does feel connected enough, sort of, if you could just talk about that, because I imagine there's some people here in the audience who are either teachers or research and policy folks who are interested in you know, that process being, being better. So if you could just speak to your perspective on what that looked like, and then we can pop in. Uh, and I see a question that's come in, we'll get started with those questions as well. Yeah, of course. Um, so one of the greatest opportunities I had was when I did my master's degree at the University of Miami, there's really a focus on teacher researchers and teacher practitioners. So how do we take practitioners and make sure the people that are in the classroom are becoming researchers? So this big push for teacher researchers. And during that time, um, my two big areas that I was focusing on was social emotional learning for students and trauma-informed care development for teachers. And so bridging those two, I was really looking at how is professional development that we really see for trauma-informed care and how we want to develop different skills for students, what's the overlap there? Um, and so how I ended up at that point, as we said, I did a literature review um, on the different professional developments. My original research was a review of all the developments that were available and what was found to be effective for in-service teachers. And so I had this thesis, it was great. And then as I had shared with you, I was like, oh, my professor read it and like, yeah, it was great. Um, and so when I interviewed for this position, I was like, I really want to work to bridge the gap between research and practice. As someone who just completed my master's degree, saw all this work, and then was going back into the classroom where it felt like the same things were still happening. Um, I was like, there's got to be a way to start getting practical skills to teachers. Something that's great about this work is it's practical skills. We can give mindfulness trainings, em empathy, forgiveness trainings, things like that are practical things that you can give teachers and tools that they can add to their toolbox that they can use every single day. Um, and that was what was really important to me. I was really tired of being given theories and how theory can impact practice. And theory is great and important and really important for your foundation. Um, but once you're a practitioner, you're like, okay, give me tangible skills. And that was what was really important to me. I wanted to find a way um, to take the research I had done and give it to a broader audience so that it could start to reach teachers. It could start to reach classrooms. Um, especially just when you're in a school, you see how far away it can feel. Um, and so that was just my goal. I wanted to be able to, this area that I cared so much about, I wanted it to reach the people that I thought needed it the most. That's awesome. That's awesome. And there's a comment here uh, that, you know, absolutely, we need to go beyond districts to the state and federal levels. And um, that's one of the things that we did over Sabrina's time here. Um, really thinking about like what are the state policymakers, whether they are at the agency level or legislators who might find this relevant and sharing, we continue to share this brief with them. And then also tying in some of those federal policy recommendations as we did. Um, but but absolutely, certainly thinking about not not letting research end at the brief publication point like this is just the beginning and there's a there's a ton of outreach that can be done to make sure that it gets into the hands of those who need it most so we have a question from sean it says i'm interested in addressing the realism beyond beyond the research realm as discussed as part of the introduction graduate training needs to provide policy implications and uh lobbying efforts for education students. Any comments? Uh, do you include this as a recommendation? So I'm, I'm reading this as what ways can we, uh, on that, that uh, teacher preparation point that you were making, um, how might those programs be made better to, to weave in some of that policy uh, expertise from the beginning? 
Yeah, so Dr. Post, I really appreciate your question. As someone who's on the teacher preparation side, I really appreciate you being here um, and giving that feedback. So what was really interesting for me, my master's degree was in education and social change. Um, so we're looking at policy and how are different things we're doing impacting um, social change overall in the classroom. And then I took the step to build this internship. So what I could take from what I learned there and then use it in a policy realm. And so, yeah, I think it would be absolutely incredible if there was a way those two were connected. Um, this was a really great stepping stone for me to go from graduate research to policy implications. Um, and a lot of times when you see in teacher prep programs, originally when you do your undergrad, you're like learning theory, and then you have a built-in experience in the classroom. If in graduate education work, especially policy, if they're doing all this background research, if they could have the opportunity for like a policy experience built in, um, I think that's a really untapped area of where we can get teacher researchers into the policy world and start getting them to have seats and voices at the table. Absolutely. Um, and I'll, I can give a shout out to my alma mater. <laughs> uh, so Teachers College, Columbia University, um, really was, I think, one of the first grad programs to have an explicit policy experience as part of the focus. So um, while the, there was a policy concentration, but there was also an opportunity to spend time in DC and meet uh, advocates. And this was now a while ago. <laughs> but it's interesting to see a lot of those players uh, roles and voices are, you know, colleagues that have been mine for the past 17 years. So I think that there is a real opportunity for certain programs to, to you know, beef up in those ways. And even as we said before, um, as we were talking about cross-listing with psychology departments for some of the teacher SEL, there is an opportunity for sure to cross-list with some of the policy programs as well to further uh, sort of draw those linkages between the research and, and practice. I know that that was something I was certain certainly looking for uh, back then. And, and we hope with this fellowship and with other experiences that students are able to um, get those experiences, even, even if they weren't able to do it in their graduate programs. Let's see if we have any other, any other questions. I don't see any others in the chat right now. Um, we will stay around as long as you all have questions. Um, Sabrina, is there anything else you want to share about your experience as a Lee Fellow, um, your experience uh, with this work? There may be some who are interested in potentially being Lee Fellows next year or um, maybe interested in uh, just sort of what this work looks like, taking an equity lens, looking at the Southern region. Um, anything you want to share just about your experience for those who might be interested or might know someone who would be interested in this experience in the future? Yeah, I think something that I would definitely want to share is just as educators that start to look at opportunities outside of the classroom um, to not underestimate yourself that you have a lot that teachers have a lot of skills to offer besides academic instruction. Um, and that looking at outside opportunities doesn't necessarily mean leaving the classroom. There's such a stigma attached to leaving the classroom. Um, but I just want to encourage teachers that there's such a great opportunity to offer your skills to utilize them in other capacities. For me, I'm going back to the classroom. I was able to do this experience, um, but I know that impacting students every day is how I wanna spend the majority of my time. Utilizing this different research and working with students is what I would, that's what I wanna spend my life doing. Um, and so I just, the thing that I've learned the most is you read about teacher researchers and teacher policymakers, um, just how important that role is um to highlight what's the work that educators are doing and that that doesn't necessarily have to mean an end of educating for people that they can kind of do a crossover of work they can continue as practitioners while also utilizing those skills to impact policy that's great and sabrina you're going to be going back to the classroom in the fall is that right so what's one thing from your research that you plan to take with you sort of this time around, <laughs> now that you thought about uh, ways in which you can, you know, apply research to your experience. Is there anything you'd like to share about how you're potentially thinking about uh, that work moving forward? Yeah, definitely. I think this has given me an opportunity to really see like, well, like 
in a larger sense how it can impact teachers and opportunities to lead professional developments at my own school. Um, I'm really excited to take this publication with me here. Like it's a recognized research that's happening. It's real, it's not just my thoughts, like what I think is happening in my classroom and then using that to lead different professional developments. So I'm gonna start initiatives at my school and reach out to the district where I'll be at um, to really help teachers and give them tools. That's the biggest thing. Um, it's really hard. A lot of times when you go to professional developments as a teacher, you're like, okay, just another thing they like want me to do. Um, so making sure that when I do these opportunities that there's actually tangible takeaways. Here's something you can try tomorrow in your classroom. Here's something you can do today to help you be better prepared for tomorrow. Um, and I think for me, that's the thing that would be the biggest impact. That's great. And for all who are listening, either live or watching the recording, this is not the last you'll hear from Sabrina. <laughs> One of the things that we did was keep a running document of potential additional briefs and research topics because it was just such a rich topic. And there are uh, so many things that we could go into here, but couldn't go into in depth. And so um, I'm well, I'm sure <laughs> that in the future we'll hear more from Sabrina. But I, again, Thank you, congratulations on such a great summer. So glad we were able to be supportive and it's been an honor to work with you and, um, and author this work that I hope is useful to others. And um, thank you to everyone who was able to join us today. Again, the recording will be available on the same page where you registered and we'll also send you an email with a link to it. If you haven't already, you can access the brief uh, at the link that Megan dropped in the chat. It'll also be available on the replay page as well. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Yes, thank you.